Okay. Good morning. We continue today the study of the automorphism of the plane, and then we extend the study to the case of the Riemann sphere to some other sets. Okay. So last time, just to call you that we considered function from C into C, so entire functions, holomorphic with inverse holomorphic. Huh? And after some consideration, quite simple consideration with the tools we have so far uh, developed, we concluded that the only possibilities are the following functions, with A different from 0, correct? So, we actually, and just to recall you what we did, we actually um, consider entire functions and and established by uh, by showing that the image of any neighborhood of the infinite of the point at infinity is not dense that the point at infinity cannot be a, an essential singularity for the function f okay similarly we also said that for topological reasons okay the, the point at infinity cannot be uh, removable singularity for the function unless it is constant, so it cannot be invertible. And so it can be just the case that f, the entire function f has a pole at infinity, but in this case the pole has to have order 1, so it becomes a polynomial of degree 1. So the set of automorphism of C, which will be denoted but a U T, okay, automorphism of C is in fact the set of function A and B are complex numbers and A is not zero. Okay? So quite simple. Now let us uh, observe that these transformations we call transformations when we refer to function which represent a transformation of a set into itself with an inverse. So any transformation is an anti-transformation, so just okay. Of course, includes the identity for a equal to 1 and b equal to 0, okay. And you can invert each of these functions. So this is a group um, with the... Um, respect to the composition of functions, okay? This is a group, okay? Composition is this small circle, uh, is a group, all right? When we have a, a group of transformation, or more in general, say, a group or semi-group of transformation acting on a set, we say that we have an action. Okay, so the general setting is the following. We have a set E set and a say semi-group G. And we associate to the pair G okay E with G in G and E in E an element E prime in E. Okay? With this property that when we consider another element of G, okay, of the group of semi group, okay, and we consider sorry, G G prime, okay, which is an element in G with this uh bullet to represent the operation in G, okay, this is an element in G, then we have that this element is in fact acting on E in the following way. This is like the action of G over G prime of E, okay? This is the only request 
to have an action. Then if the semigroup has uh, the identity, necessarily the identity acts on the <coughs> on the set, leaving everything fixed. Okay, so it's, it is expected, right? So this is this defines an, an action on the set E. It can be whatever you want. Okay, very abstract and G, very poor algebraic structure. Has a very poor algebraic structure. Semi group is a minimal okay, request, correct? So in particular, we can apply to our considerations this terminology and observe that well. that given a transformation like this and how it's see it acts on C. How? Well, this transformation is phi, okay? And phi of Z is an element of C. All right? So we can say the pair phi and Z defines an element V of Z in C. This is an action. And it is readily seen that F, if F, say, F1 acts after F of Z, this is F1 okay, which is in C as expected. Now for the actions on, of semi-group or groups on a set, there are some special properties which are sometimes fulfilled or not. In particular, we say that the action of G on E is transitive or or G acts transitively on E if for any E E prime in E there exists G in E such that G E is E prime. Sorry. Hmm? Is mapped by the action to E prime. So the action is called transitive when you have two points on a set, okay, and the first point is mapped onto the other, into the other by an element of the group G. This is the general setting. So in our case, we could say that the automorphism of C acts transitively, all right? So on C <coughs> acts transitively on C. In fact, given Z0 and W0 in C, have to find transformation in out C. I have to find A and B such that the transformation associated to the choice of this pair of A and B, which defines the function in out C, maps, for instance, a Z naught into W naught. Okay? An example is the following. Well, take as phi of Z to be the map z minus z naught plus w naught. Hmm? This is an element in out c with the property the phi of z naught is w naught. Okay? Geometrically, we have here what? Uh, a linear transformation, as, as it was pointed out last time, but geometrically, this is a uh, translation 
in the plane. And here we have a dilation and a rotation. So that we have all the motions, the rigid motions of the plane. That explains geometrically, if you want, the property we have so you have at, uh, described here analytically. So any two pair of points can be uh, associated by, can be, say, map one into the other by, by one of these transformations, right? So geometrically means that, OK, we can do it. And actually here, in this example, it is easily seen that we don't have even to rotate anything. See, the, the, the coefficient of z is 1. So there is no rotation component in the transformation. But just we consider the translation. OK? So we have two points in the plane. This is Z naught, this is W naught, and the transformation is this. This is exactly this vector, if you want it to play, right? Well, this is an example of, of um, transitive action. So <coughs> we continue studying now the case of the Riemann sphere and the automorphism of the Riemann sphere. Okay? Let us try to describe this set. All right. So, as I said, we cannot expect to have a holomorphic function in the entire Riemann sphere to be, in, to be something different from a constant function. Right? Because restricted to the plane, so without the point at infinity, it will be bounded because it is continuous function on a compact set. Then holomorphic, bounded, holomorphic entire, bounded means constant because of Liu Weil's theorem. So for sure, the, 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 the function we will be dealing with have to have at least one pole. Okay? Good. So, we can just say, well, with the experience of working with transformations, the linear transformation and, and the plane, what we expect to have is something which is the ratio of two linear transformation. Right? Because this is an example of a polynomial, of, sorry, of a rational function whose denominator is a polynomial of degree. 1 and denominator of degree 1 as well. Correct? We cannot have higher degrees because otherwise, it would, so the order of the rational function cannot be greater than 1 because the function cannot have multiple zeros of, of poles of order greater than 1 because they have to be injective. So I will start considering this fact. Take this M, that be the set of transformation, which are as follows. Okay? With A, B, C, D complex numbers, and it is really seen that in order to have an inverse of this function, this is function, okay? In the in the in the Riemann sphere, right? It can be invertible if this number is different from zero. I invite you to check, but it is, well, I think something standard for, for, for a math class, okay? Well, you in fact, can associate a, a matrix, two by two matrix, to this transformation, and notice that this is nothing but the determinant, right? So if you want to invert it, well, the terminal has to be different from zero. In any case, I invite you to verify that when you put W to be sorry, AZ plus B over CZ plus D, then you can obtain Z 
as a function of w if and only if a d minus b c is different from zero. Okay. Now, what I can say is that with this assumption m, the set of the transformation I described this <coughs> and the set, so the m, the set m, is in fact contained in the set of automorphism of C. Correct? So any such transformation with these assumptions here is in fact a transformation of C hat. Hmm? Of course, we have to uh, sorry, to define this function it apparently is defined only uh, for z different from uh, minus d over c, right? And it is not defined for z equal to infinity, but in fact we extend this when z is minus d over c, the value of the function is infinity and when z is infinity the value of the function is a over c, which is exactly what you have if you replace what it is inside, outside, you know, with this stereographic projection, put 1 over z and calculate the function is 0. Take the reciprocal and everything works fine. So with this uh, position, this function is defined for any z on the Riemann sphere. And it is invertible. It is 1 to 1. So it is an automorphism of c hat. So now the problem is, is this m exactly out of c hat? So are there other transformations beside the functions we have described so far, which can be an automorphism of c hat? Well, in this case, it, it can be helpful to remind a very, very simple fact from algebra. You probably know, okay? Assume that you have, let me use the same notation. Well, assume that you have a subset of a group, say, sorry, a subgroup huh, of the group G or transformation. Okay, G acts on say E, okay, and H is a subgroup of G, right? And assume that H contains G x naught. It is indicated by G x naught. What is this? This is uh, uh, the stabilizer or the isotropy subgroup. And then I say with respect to Z to x naught. What do I mean by this? I mean the, the set of all transformation which uh, keep which keep uh, uh, x not fixed, which match which match which maps x not into itself. Okay, so g of x not is the set of g in g such that g x not is mapped into x not. I'm sorry, this is not. What I'm saying here, this is the pair. It's not the action. The action, the action is indicated in this way. So, if you want, well, normally this is. But with this, we don't mean that G is a function of X naught. Okay, it is. Okay, the action. In the previous example, the two notation, in fact are the same because you calculate the value of a function at a point and this was said to be the transformed of the pair transformation, okay? But this is the same most general fact. I'm not saying that this is the case for only for out C or for something else, but this is for the general. Well, what is the statement of this simple lemma? And I refer it to it as a, the algebraic lemma, okay? The statement is that actually H, okay, if g x naught is contained in H, 
then h is g. No, for one it's not. Mm -hmm. I show you this. Take g and g. Okay, and calculate. Oh, wait, I for, wait, I forgot to say something. Yes, wait. And act, H acts transitively. There are two points huh, to be fulfilled. So take G, any element of the group, and so calculate G of X naught. Which is not necessarily x naught, right? Something else. otherwise g would be in g x naught. So in general, this is something else, and e. Okay. Now, since h acts transitively on e, there exists an h in h such that h of zero of x naught is x naught. I can take two pairs of point and I find a transformation. So in particular, I take this point and the other point is x naught in such a way that this is in fact h plus g of x naught. So that h plus g is in g of x naught. Okay. So this is in, in uh, g of x naught. H is uh, sorry, G of X naught is in H, so this is in H. Particular H is in H, G is in H. That's it. So for any G in G, we prove that G is actually in H, the subgroup we consider with these two properties. And we apply this lemma for our, this is a, an algebraic lemma, right? For our situation. So. In fact, we have we have that the set M, hmm, the set of transformation of this form, which are called also linear fractional transformation. Okay, so these are called linear fractional transformation. And yes, I agree with you. In some textbooks, they are also called matrix transformation. But I will use the terminology for for a special class, okay, of linear fractional transformation. So I prefer to say linear fraction to say the general case, and then maybe transformation for a special subclass, okay, if you don't mind. But in some books, and also in what we'll see later, this this set is called maybe transformation. But if I say linear fractional transformation, I just refer to this, and maybe transformation to something else, okay. So what we have is that M is a subgroup of So out C hat plays the role of the group G in the previous lemma, and this M plays the role. So eventually we'll play the role of the uh, subgroup H. Okay? Okay. Let me just um, take uh, G in. Well, M acts transitively on C hat, on the Riemann sphere. Why? Well, we can arrange A, B, C, D in such a way that the point, for instance, zero is mapped to infinity, okay, for instance. And this is what we need. Because, of course, in M, uh, we can also think of 
having the automorphism of C with which is extended to the case of infinity if the infinite is mapped into infinite. It, it is the case when C is 0 okay, which gives you one transformation of out C. Actually out C the automorphism of C can be regarded as the isotropy group of infinity. In fact, the transformation A Z plus B, when extended to the Riemann sphere with the assumption that infinity is mapping to infinity, keeps infinity fixed. Okay. Good. Well. Now take G in out C hat. So generic. We can we can assume <coughs> that after composing G with C of Z, which is Z minus G naught, Z minus G of infinity. G of infinity is a number. So it is a number. Is an element of the C of a C hat, right? Interesting. Then we can assume that G of zero is zero, and G of infinity is infinity. If not, we use this transformation. And we consider G tilde to be C composed to G. Okay? Well, C belongs to M. Why? Because G naught and G infinity cannot be the same. Right? Good. Now, with this assumption, this function G is in fact <coughs> since g of 0 is 0 in the power expansion of g in a neighborhood of 0 okay the a naught is 0 okay so that i can consider g of z over z and this is an entire function why because we don't have any problem of poles We have problem. No, we have no problem with poles since a naught is zero. So when we divide, we obtain a power expansion of z without denominators in z, right? So this is an entire function, all right? And since g of infinity is infinity, and g is injective. The function g of z over z is, well, this is smaller than r. That is to say, this function here is bounded. It is unbounded only at infinity. All the other values are bounded. Therefore, g of z over z is constant. All right, and then g of z is lambda c, which is still in m. Okay, so g is in m. Okay, so this proves that m is actually the set of automorphisms of the Riemann sphere. So, linear fraction transformations are in fact the set of, form the set of the automorphism we'll see. Notice that if we imagine uh, to associate to the transformation A Z plus B, C Z plus D, this 
two by two by two matrix, matrix. Okay, we are. This is in. Okay, since we have the hypothesis, linear group, two C, right? Two C means it means that the two by two matrices with the entries in C, and whose determinant is different from zero. Okay. But we also observe that if we take lambda, any lambda in C, okay, lambda of course different from zero, and we multiply each coefficient here times lambda, that is to say, if we consider lambda times A, B, C, D, which is the matrix lambda A, lambda B, lambda C, and lambda D. To this matrix, we associate the same transformation because we have a numerator lambda A Z plus lambda B over lambda C Z plus lambda D, which is A Z plus B over B Z plus D. So that we can define not just one matrix associated with transformation, but a class. Okay, a P1 thing, huh? a line of classes, uh, oh, a line of matrices. So that in this automorphism, this set of automorphisms C hat is described, is better described by, by the PSL to C, that is to say the special linear, projective special linear. Uh, um, group of matrices, two by two matrices in C, okay. So these are matrices with entries such that A D minus B C is plus or minus one. All right. This is another representation if you want of the same group, which is important to know, but all right. And now, <coughs> what are simple examples of these transformations? Well, the simple examples are the following. One simple example is essentially this. This is one of the cases, right? When C is 0 and D is equal to 1, right? Or particular this. Yes. So translations can be considered a special case. But then also this transformation, this all belong to M, right? This transformation, the inversion, okay, one of the functions you studied in your exercises is in fact a, a transformation, is a, an invertible. Uh, function on the Riemann sphere. Okay. Of course, this can be regarded as an element of M when we extend the, the, this function also to infinity, putting infinity is mapped into infinity. So, hmm? and if we take, so we have simple translation inversions, and then we can have also dilation and rotation. For instance, this is also a nice example. Okay. Now take S1 to be Z uh, plus D over C. Take S2, sorry, S1 over Z, right? S2 over Z to be 1 over Z. And S3 of C, oh sorry, this is translation, so inversion. And here we put a, a BC minus AD, BC minus AD, which is different from 0 over C squared times Z, which is dilation, a complex dilation, right? Which means there is a factor rotates and the factor which dilates in real sense. 
And then we also add this transformation, which is another translation. So we have two translations. Uh, this is ordered, right? S1, S2, S3, S4. And if you consider S4 composed to S3, composed to S2, composed to S1 of Z, this gives you precisely. So that any transformation, any linear fraction transformation is in fact a combination of translation, inversion, and dilations. Okay, so I invite you to verify this with this. I, I checked once. Okay, that this this uh, this this choice of coefficients are correct. But so you can arrange it in case <laughs> in order to make it uh, correct. But the idea is clear, right? So, in fact, now I want to show you a short movie about this fact. Okay, movie. Yes, movie. Okay, these are translations, as you can see. This is dilations, right? So the square is dilated and then it will be rotated. What is difficult to see is the inversion, right? To imagine. So what is in, out. Good. But in general, the complicated situation is that the combination, okay, of this is an inversion, rotation, and rotation, and then probably also comes in. Spinning is a rotation. Version is this. Okay, so we have in some sense that any linear factor of transformation is a combination of simple, or simpler uh, linear factor transformation, this is a translation, dilation, and inversions. And this is important to remember. Now, I prefer not to use the terminology which is somehow adopted in other cases, that is Möbius transformation for linear factor transformation, because I refer to Möbius transformation just for automorphism of the disk. So we have just considered two cases of automorphism sets of uh, unbounded sets, right? So consider transformation of the plane and of the Riemann sphere. Now I want to consider just one case, and it will be not one case, but the case, as we will see, of a bounded domain. And the bounded domain we choose is Denoted, it will be denoted by D, OK? 
Okay, blackboard D is the set of Z in C such that the modulus of Z is smaller than 1. This is called the unit disk. Okay. Now assume that you have, now comes another lemma, quite interesting, it is called Schwarz, Schwarz lemma. Which is not, uh, which which is a tool for many for many other things, but it will be fundamental for the description of the automorphism of the unit disk. So assume that you have a function f holomorphic from the disk into itself, and assume that this function maps zero into zero. So then we have the following fact. Then f of z has modulus smaller or equal to modulus of z and f prime of 0 has modulus smaller or equal to 1. And furthermore, f we have that f prime of 0 is in modulus equal to 1 or there is a z naught in D but not 0 such that modulus of f of z naught is equal to z naught. So, we have an equality here or an equality here, right? Then necessarily there exists uh, theta in R such that f of z is e i theta times z. So, it is a rotation keeping 0 fixed. And E i theta is precisely f prime of 0. So, all this information are in this very simple apparently Schwarz lemma. In fact, it is considered a lemma, it is in a, a fundamental theorem <laughs> in the theory. As you will see, the proof is extremely simple compared to the importance of this uh, lemma. And I don't know precisely the, the, the history of the evolution. You know that in, in the history of the mathematics, there are some kind of approximation of results. Huh? Normally, there are some first steps, something some, which describes something else, then some other else comes in and says, OK, but maybe we can remove this hypothesis. Okay, you can uh, adjust the, the conclusion. I think that this version is due to Poincaré. Okay, but in any case, this is known as Schwarz lemma. So, <coughs> the proof, the proof goes like this. And well, I didn't put here. This is eight, and this is nine. Right. So, since we have a holomorphic function keeping zero fixed, as already observed in the previous case of the automorphism. C hat, then we can consider <coughs> this function, and this is holomorphic. Since f of 0 is 0, it's holomorphic in D. Once again, I repeat the idea you take the expansion at 0 of this function, and A naught, so the first coefficient is not bearing, so it's, it's not in business. So, that we can divide by z and the result is an analytic function. Good. So, this is holomorphic. Um, we take now, this is the unit disk, this is 0. We take our this disk or the r smaller than 1 and greater than 0, OK? Um, 
and we consider the modulus of FOC over Z. If you want, call this function G of Z. This is the modulus of G of Z. Hmm. Well, we can say the following. Since the maximum of the modulus is taken for sure on the boundary, we can restrict our consideration on the boundary, right? Because this is holomorphic function. So we apply maximum principle. So that, well, this number here is smaller than what? The maximum on the circle of f of z and modulus of z is r, right? But the maximum of f, is, since f of d is contained in d, can be at most 1. Because f of z is in d. So modulus of f of z is smaller than 1. So this is 1 over r. Right? Remember that f of z is smaller than 1, as modulus smaller than 1, and the maximum is taken at the boundary of the disk. Right? Maximum modulus principle tells us this. Right? So this, this is valid for any r. So when I take the limit as r tends to 1 from the left of modulus of g of z, this is independent, right? And so we obtain that this is smaller. This tends to 1. But this means then f of z over modulus z is smaller or equal to 1, right? Or f of z. Is smaller or equal to as modulus smaller or equal to modulus of z. Similarly, this number here, this sorry, this function here can be regarded as the incremental ratio of f at zero. Because it is f of z minus f of zero. This is also f of z minus f of zero, which is zero over z minus zero. So that this, the same fact tells us that the derivative of 0 of f is a modulus smaller or equal to 1. And this is the first part of the statement. Now, Let us come back to, to the same okay, description because everything is on this inequality. Assume that you have an equality at one point. Assume that f of z0 over z0 is modulus equal to 1, which means that okay, we have equality here, right? At a point inside the disk, different from 0, of course. Hmm? Then we have that the function g is in fact achieving its maximum inside it, so it is constant. It is constantly equal to z naught in modulus. So after rotation, f of z is z naught, okay? Which tells us exactly what we want. So this is very important. Uh, consequences, um, one of this is that we can describe the automorphism of the unit disk in the following way. We we'll describe it to be the set which we we'll call the Mabius transformation, the set of Mabius transformation defined as follows. Where theta is a real number and C0 is an element in the disk, which should be somehow familiar to you because in one of the exercises without this rotation factor, you had to study this and say, okay, this function, this function, okay, C0 is given in D, 
Okay, this, all this family is formed by uh, functions which are holomorphic in the entire disk up to the boundary actually. So it is holomorphic in the closure of the. The reason is that, well, this is a polynomial and this is also a polynomial. This is a ratio polynomial. The only problem could be that this polynomial vanishes. In fact, it vanishes. It has a pole, but it is outside the unit disk. So inside the unit disk, this function is holomorphic. But this doesn't mean anything else, except that first we have to prove that it maps the disk into itself. So we consider this difference. Um, and this difference, okay. If we prove that if this difference is positive, then we are done. So we prove that the image and the z is in d, of course. Taken any z in d, if this number is positive, we prove that the image of any z and for any z not in d uh, is in fact in d, okay. So. The modulus of EI theta is 1, so we don't really care about it. Well, this becomes 1 minus z naught bar z squared minus z minus z naught squared over 1 minus z naught bar z squared, which is a positive real number when z is and z naught uh, are taken in z, in d, sorry. So to prove that this is positive, it suffices to consider this difference on the, numerator, on the numerator, right? So we calculate this, separately and prove that this number is in fact positive. Okay, this is Okay, the module square is the number times its conjugate. Which gives us the following. So we have 1 minus z naught z bar minus z naught bar z plus and then we have modulus of z naught squared times modulus of z squared. then minus modulus of z squared, then minus modulus of z naught squared, and then uh, have plus z, z naught bar plus z naught z bar, which luckily cancel this to other z naught z bar and minus z naught bar z cancel z naught bar z here. So at the end of the day, we have 1 plus modulus z naught square, modulus z squared minus z squared minus modulus z naught square, which can be also written as 1 minus modulus of z naught square times 1 minus modulus of z squared, which is positive since we are taking z naught and z in the unit disk. Okay, so this is the claim. So the first step is to prove that these functions are, in fact, mapping the unit disk into itself. And this is done. They are holomorphic, and this is important. Are they invertible? This, yes, they are, because they are special cases, uh, they are special case of the linear fractional transformation. The coefficient is e i theta, what do you mean? We can see, oh sorry, 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 we cannot see, sorry, sorry. We can prove it directly, but if you want you can regard this automorphism of the unit, well this set, and this Mebius transformation as a subset of the linear fractional transformation, right? 
uh, with specific choices of the coefficients. Well, not, the, you had not the freedom of choosing A, B, C, D as you want, but you have just that you choose B and A, and then you have C and D given automatically. <laughs> and B and A has to be taken, well, A modulus 1, B with modulus more than 1. OK? So verify, verifying that this is the case, so we have A I theta times D minus and then the modulus of, uh, of sinus square, right, which is smaller than 1. So it cannot be that, that, that uh, A B minus C D, A D minus B C is equal to 0. We are on the safe side. However, if you don't want to, to use this such an argument, you can prove it directly and say, well, if W is E i theta z minus z naught over 1 minus z naught bar z, what is if I want to express z in terms of w? Is it always possible? Yes, it is, as we will see. And it is instructive to make it once in your life so that you can see how is the inverse of the function of the uh, Mabius transformation given. So, in fact, this is w minus w z naught bar z <coughs> so if i collect everything say on the right hand side for instance i have uh, i have that z i theta plus w z naught bar is W plus E I C naught. That is this number here. Remember that W is in D. Z naught bar is in D as well. So this can never have modulus equal to 1, this product. So can I ever cancel this, which has modulus 1? Hmm? So we can divide, this is never zero. So we have this is which looks like maybe transformation, but then we have to adjust the, uh, and put this way e minus i theta, and I have one here plus it is sorry, minus minus e i theta with a minus in front, so minus i i theta, z naught bar, and then w. And here I have w minus e i theta minus e i theta z naught. Right? So call c to be minus e i theta z naught and observe that this is e minus e i theta w minus c over 1 minus c bar w and this belongs to d. So it is as expected another maybe transformation with different coefficient z naught okay and different thetas, minor theta. So it's important to remember this. And finally, what I will not prove, and I invite you not to waste your time in this kind of calculation, is that when you compose two such Mabius transformations, you obtain a Mabius transformation, which apparently is the easy part to be proven, but it's not. So take, uh, call this this one, e i theta 1 z minus z 1 over 1 minus z 1 bar z, the first transformation, and the other is theta 2 z minus z 2 over 
1 minus z2 bar z, call it phi 1 of z, phi 2 of z, both phi 1 and phi 2 are Mabius transformation, okay, are Mabius transformation. So, what is the situation when I compose this two Mabius transformation? Well, in fact, this is the odd part. A lot of calculation has to be done. But uh, luckily, some, someone else has already done it before us, so we can just copy the results and, be, and, and uh, trust him, okay? <laughs> But in any case, just for the sake of completing, I show you that this is E i theta 1 plus theta 2, and then along this is E minus i theta 2, z 1, z 2 bar over 1 plus E i theta 2, z 2, z 1 bar, which of course has modulus 1. This is the this is a complex number, and here we have the conjugate of this complex number. So this is modulus 1, and we'll play the role of the constant in front, so e i something, times z minus, I write this way, h of z 1 over 1 minus h of z 1 bar of z, where h of z 1, h of z, sorry, is e minus i theta 2 z plus e i theta 2 z 2 over 1 plus e i theta 2 z 2 z and I have put a bar here which has the aspect of a Mabius transformation. Okay. So what we have at the time being is the following. We don't, we cannot describe anything else but a subset of the automorphism of the unit disk. So I, I call M, so this um, this M is different from the other ones as the set of Mabius transformation. Either you write this way or you put this double dots, umlaut in German, on the letter so Mabius transformations. And I can say that M is, in fact, a subset of the, the automorphism of the unit disk because I proved that, well, it is stable. I proved. I claimed that it is stable uh, with respect to composition, and I proved that actually each of this is a transformation of the unit disk, so it maps the unit disk into itself, it is holomorphic, and with an inverse which is also holomorphic. What is left to prove is that actually we have an equality here, and this can be done, <coughs> well, theoretically this is very, quite difficult huh, to prove. We have a subset and anything else. But this can be done putting together the algebraic lemma and the Schwartz lemma. Well, notice that I take um, F from the unit disk into itself. Okay, and assume that it fixes zero. All right. Then in general we have that f of z as modulus modulus equal to modulus of z, right? So in particular, take f in the subset of the automorphism of d, keeping zero fixed. So take the isotropy groups of the identity, uh, the identity of the origin, right? We restrict our case, our consideration to the those automorphisms of the unit disk which keep zero fixed. So we know in general this is valid not for the automorphism, for any holomorphic function. 
that when it fixes the origin, then we have this inequality. Now, this means that in particular, f has an inverse because it is an automorphism. Hmm? And we indicate this inverse f minus 1. Now, we have that if w is f of z, the modulus of w, which is the modulus of f of z, is smaller or equal to the modulus of z, right? But the modulus of um, z is also the modulus of f minus 1 of w, right? Because we are dealing with an automorphism. And in particular, since f is in this isotropy subgroup, also f minus 1 belongs to this isotropy subgroup because of course if 0 is mapped into 0, the inverse maps 0 into 0. So also for f minus 1, we can apply Schwarz lemma. And we conclude the following. This is so that this f is pi theta c because we have an equality. Right? So any element of the automorphism is in fact, sorry, any element of the automorphism group is contained is in M. All right? So because of the description of those uh, function which map the unit disk into itself, keeping zero fixed in general, in particular for the elements of the isotropy subgroup at the origin, we have this in a, this equality, right? Which this W is in D, which implies using the Schwarz lemma this that the function is the rotation, right? Good. That is. Starting from here, we can conclude that it is a major transformation. It is a major transformation. It is for z not equal to zero. Hmm? Therefore, we have the set of major transformation contains the isotropy subgroup of zero, which is the first ingredient. The second ingredient is that, well, it is easily seen that starting from any Z, with then uh, sorry, with a starting from any Z naught in the disk, this map map this written here, this transformation written here maps Z naught into zero, and this suffices to prove to say that M acts transitively. You have a point, any point, this point is mapped into zero. Take another point Z one, this is mapped into zero by the corresponding Mebius with the choice of Z1 here, takes, take it its inverse. So we have the composition of the two Mebius transformation, which is still a Mebius transformation, maps Z0 into 0, take the inverse, 0 to Z1. So maps Z0 to Z1 for any pair of points Z0 and Z1. Right? Are you okay? Okay. So we have the two um, conditions. M acts transitively. Maybe I write it on this final slide. M acts transitively on D since for any Z naught in D this function call it phi of Z naught even without the rotation coefficient is such that F of Z naught calculated Z naught is zero. 
Therefore, if I take Z0 and Z1 in D and I define F of Z1 to be this maybe transformation, I compose F of Z1 minus 1 with F of Z0. This is transformation, so it has an, inv an inverse. And this is still a Mabius transformation. And this is the Mabius transformation which maps Z0 into 0 and from 0 to Z1. So that is Z0 to Z1. Good. And also, I have shown using the Schwarz lemma that M contains the isotopy group of the origin. Therefore, M is, sorry, sorry, <laughs> this is because of the algebraic lemma, where M plays the role of the former H, and this is isotropy subgroup, so uh, and the D is the set E, right, in the general stuff in the general setting. Now we have a description of the automorphism of the unit disk and this is important. So we have also a description of uh, uh, of uh, set of transformation um, acting on a bounded set. So just to conclude, let me point out that we can have some extra result from the Schwartz lemma, or several results actually. And in particular, what is somehow uh, easy to remove is what apparently is essential in the proof. This is to say that f of 0 is mapping to 0. So take any holomorphic function f from the unit disk into itself. Right? F of zero is, call it W zero, which lies in D. Okay? Um, well, in general, so Consider the gen generic situation called W naught F of Z naught. All right, so Z naught is somewhere here, and W naught is somewhere else. Right. So what I'm doing is the following: I compose the function F with two Mabius transformations in such a way that the composition maps zero into zero. All right. So I have this preferred pair of points Z0 and W0, two, two points. So if Z0 is 0 and W0 is 0, so we are exactly in the situation where uh, the assumption of, of uh, Schwarz lemma. But if not, so consider phi of Z0 to be uh, Z, well, the inverse. So I want this. Okay, this is a Mabius transformation, which is the inverse of the one with the minus. Okay, and then take those so phi of uh, f of z naught to be uh, z minus f of z naught over one minus f of z naught bar z. Okay, I could put also this as w naught. Okay, then I take phi of w naught, composed f, composed phi of z naught minus 1. Observe that this function here maps 0 into z naught. So its inverse maps z naught into 0.
but no, I take, sorry, I take this function precisely, so they maps, it maps 0 into Z0, correct, then this maps Z0 into F of Z0, is W0, and then, good, F of Z0, here, cancel the numerator. So this is a function which is, is holomorphic in D. It's a composition of holomorphic functions in D. And such that of this function G, G of 0 is 0. So l let us repeat again. So. 0 is mapped by phi of z0 into z0. f maps z0 into f of z0 or w0, and phi of f of z0 maps z f of z0 into 0. All right? So, what we know is from Schwarz lemma, then modulus of g of z is smaller or equal to modulus of z. And then we have the other two conditions. With the quality at, a quality at one point implies the quality at any point then, uh, right? and the function is up to a rotation the value. Hmm? And here is precisely, again, if g prime of zero is modulus equal to one, then it is that G of Z is E I theta C. So the statement I'm going to summarize is known as Schwarz Peak Lemma. And tells us the following take F from D into D holomorphic then for any Z and Z naught in D we have that F of Z minus F of Z naught over one minus F of Z naught bar F of Z is smaller or equal to Z minus Z naught over 1 minus z naught bar z and and also f prime of z naught is in modulus uh, and if equality Holds, then F plot out. A quality holds means then, to be more precise, if there exists a Z and Z naught, a pair of points such that an equality holds, or we have this equality for one Z naught. Okay, then necessarily F is a Mabius transformation. Okay? Sorry? Okay. If a quality holds in one of the two inequalities, so either you find a pair of complex numbers of modulus more than one such that this is the case with quality or you obtain or oh, have one point z naught in the disk such that this mo the derivative of f at z naught has modulus uh, satisfying this equality then necessarily f is an automorphism and this comes essentially from Schwarz lemma because here you can recognize that we have all the ingredients to conclude. Because the, this inequality written in terms of G okay, becomes something else in terms of F. 
And I just conclude with this very quick observation. Then we have, remember that we have the g of z as modulus mod or equal to z, but g was was phi of f of z naught composed to f composed to phi of z naught, right? Now call f of z naught z to be w, right? So I can also say that what? Uh, this is well um, g of sorry this is phi of f of z not f of w small or equal instead of z I put phi a minus 1 of z not at w right and this concludes everything because Because this means that on the left hand side we have, well, I copy it. And this is the modulus of w minus z naught over 1 minus z naught bar w. Remember that phi of z naught was a function z minus z naught plus z naught, 1 plus z naught bar z. And this is the inverse. The inverse changes the sign, right? We have no, so we have a i theta equal to 1, so everything simplifies. And this is the inverse. And here we have f of z, f of w, sorry, minus f of z naught over 1 minus f of z naught bar f of w, which gives us the first inequality. The second inequality comes from the fact that g prime of 0 is smaller or equal to 1. Then g was phi of f of, f of z naught composed f composed phi of z naught. Then we apply the chain rule make the calculation and we obtain the other inequality. But I think that this can be done not in two minutes. So we stop here and then we continue on Monday. Thank you.